The shortest song in the world is usually considered to be the track You Suffer by the English grindcore band Napalm Death. <laughs> but just under a second and a half long, it's one of the few cases where playing the song is more efficient than naming it. When it was released in 1987, the average song was just under four and a quarter minutes, or roughly 196 You Suffers long. This was a relative high point in the life expectancy of a song, having expanded with the physical limitations of analogue recording since the days when a song averaged three minutes in length. But in the decades since, we've seen something of a regression, back down to a duration of around three minutes and 15 seconds, commonly attributed to our supposedly shrinking attention spans. But time isn't just something we measure, it's something we feel. And, as Pink Floyd's iconic song on the topic notes, this feeling is malleable. Every year is getting shorter, never seem to find the time. One of the most significant discoveries in modern history was that time is relative, neither fully subjective nor objective. And actually, music is one of the best ways to navigate this. The Czech immunologist and poet Miroslav Holob wrote that the present moment, the immediate state of consciousness in the now before we refile it as the then, lasts around two to three seconds. Taking this consensus from the world of neuroscience, he reflects in an essay, The Dimension of the Present Moment, on the consequences this realisation has with regard to our experience not only of time, but of art. It's a little known essay, but like the concept it puts forward, it packs a punch. If, as he says, we simply happen in segments and intervals, then what does the duration of the media we consume say about the way we choose to exist as beings in time? Over the next few videos, we're going to be looking at how we manage our relationship with time through the kinds of art that we pass it with, exploring how aesthetic decisions impact not only how time is spent, but experienced. But if we're going to begin anywhere, where better than the dawn of time itself? Which, of course, started with an organ. Okay, that's obviously not quite true, though the organ has been around in one form or another since the days of ancient Greece. While its grand architectural design has been practically succeeded by much cheaper, more compact, portable instruments that harness electricity rather than air, its imposing sound, or sounds, have a deep sense of historical continuity and an emotional power inscribed within them. I always get a little bit annoyed when in popular culture the organ is just used as like gothic horror. Uh, and I can see why, I mean, if you haven't grown up in churches, if you haven't spent time in the choral world, it's a very odd sound world. Anna Lapwood is an organist, choir director and music broadcaster, regularly conducting in Christian services as well as a wide variety of classical and contemporary concerts. She champions the timeless appeal of the organ. For Anna, the organ and the music it's associated with have several time-manipulating properties. There's an interesting thing whenever you talk to anyone who works in church music and they say when it's the holiday and they don't have their regular services, they say they get to six o'clock each day or each Sunday and they go, oh, I should be an even song. And I think you get so used to marking time through services when you're in this regular routine, particularly if you're somewhere where you're doing services every day. There's a lovely kind of feeling of every day at six o'clock you are just meditating through music a little bit. In church services, music is integral to the keeping of the Christian calendar, with regular services like Evensong helping to mark out the canonical hours that guide worship, and allow Christians to redeem time by providing focus and structure to their day, not to mention the regular chimes of church bells and the music of annual festivals. But music can mark time on an even larger scale. Since 2001, the Church of St. Bacardi in Halberstadt, Germany, has been home to a piece of organ music written originally for piano by John Cage, known as As Slow As Possible. Due to finish in 2640, the progression of the piece through harmonic stages has formed something of its own calendar, with chord changes, now a rare event, being witnessed like communal festivals. This kind of ritualistic listening, once the main way music was enjoyed, is now one of many contexts competing with the all-powerful on-demand model of records, CDs and digital streaming. But unlike other live music, religious music for the organ, as well as adhering to a strict time, is also indelibly connected to a specific space, symbiotic with the buildings they occupy. 
If you're a violinist, you go around different venues, and yes, your playing will change a little bit for all sorts of reasons between different venues, but ultimately it will be Joshua Bell's interpretation or Hilary Hahn's interpretation. Whereas I find when you're an organist, the way you play a piece can be so radically different between two different organs in two different buildings. The sounds will be different, the acoustics will be different, you'll have to change the tempo to match the acoustic. Uh, I had this recently, I was playing at Boardwalk Hall in America, and it's got a seven, eight second acoustic. And I had to play The Hunchback of Notre Dame so much slower than I've ever played it before because the time it took between pressing the key down and hearing the sound come back and everything, you just had to play it slower. A bit like how time bends according to gravity, the vast acoustical demands of the organ undergo a warping of musical space-time in each unique venue. Listening to recordings, it's easy to forget about this physical and temporal reality of the sounds that comprise a piece of music, especially as we have the power to stop and start at will. But some of the most provocative pieces of music of the 20th century have highlighted the varying temporal spaces music can occupy. Take composition 1960 number 7 by Lamont Young, written for piano. It's two notes at an interval of a perfect fifth, held for a long time, which can be anything from two minutes to two days, so long as the acoustic sustains it. Steve Reich, a fellow minimalist composer, demonstrates the expansion of time before our ears in his piece Four Organs, where a single chord is rhythmically augmented, made longer, and spread out across 16 minutes as the same musical material is slowed to near stasis. Time as experienced through music is not so regular and objective as the canonical hours that it's often employed to mark. We don't just measure time, we feel it. We've all had that experience when we're so engrossed in something that time itself seems to slip away from us as we enter a state of flow where our focus eclipses our ability to mark the passage of time. Both listening to and making music can be a gateway to this state. One of the things I'm always really surprised by is I finish what feels like 10 minutes practice and I'll look at my phone and I've done like an hour. And time just moves so fast when you go into that state of flow and when you're working out ideas and trying things out and experimenting. And you genuinely just lose all sense of what's going on around you. Practically speaking, time is localised. We live in different time zones across the world according to the relative position of the sun. But this kind of temporal slip Anna's describing is something we can't account for in the staggering of clocks. It has to occur within the listener's own psychological time zone, with music providing an alternate schematic for how we process time beat by beat. Take the music of Hans Zimmer, specifically in his work with Christopher Nolan. In Inception, Edith Piaf's Non Je Ne Regret Rien is used by the protagonists to measure the passage of time through their mission. The deeper the characters dream, the slower things move, and the greater the space between notes, as Zimmer expands the French classic into a cavernous soundscape penetrating the unconscious. In Interstellar, this manipulation of psychological time is re-examined in the context of general relativity. When I'm up there in hypersleep, or, or traveling near the speed of light, or near a black hole, time's gonna change for me. It's going to run more slowly. On Miller's planet, as the astronauts' personal clock slows against their orbiting ships, a clock-like pulse accelerates from 65 beats per minute, just faster than the passage of seconds, to 120 beats per minute. As we watch the scene unfold, it's the music and its fluctuating pulse that keeps us mindful of the ruthless acceleration of subjective time. Though absent from the original arrangement of Inception's score, in subsequent performances, the organ has become a prominent feature, along with its iconic foregrounding in Zimmer's score for Interstellar. For Anna Lapwood, who regularly performs Zimmer's music, there's a peculiarly human reason for why the organ has come to embody the transcendence of time. Often I think people see the organ and they see this massive machine, and I think a lot of people use it to represent this machine. For one, it's an instrument that can go on forever, like if you press a key down, the instrument doesn't need to breathe. It just, it's a machine and there is air and it can go on for a much longer period of time. But on the other hand, I think of the organ as being inherently built on breath because it's built on air. And yes, it's a very different kind of air, but it is still rooted in breath. And I think that can make it a very human thing. 
what was amazing about Hans Zimmer's score to Interstellar and what was so sort of revolutionary about it in a way was his use of the organ not as a stereotypical organ but as this gentle, loving, kind instrument that was bringing humanity to the score. And those scores like Inception, Interstellar, all of these, when you put them on the organ, there's something about the fact that when you listen to it, you know it's one person controlling all of that sound. And I think that that makes it incredibly moving when you get these massive crescendos that just seem to go on and on and on and on and on, because it's like, I think of it as kind of a crescendo of our personal emotions. And so you kind of think it's got to the lid of what your personal emotions can hold, and then it just blows that lid off. In this sense, the organ sort of operates like its biological namesake. It becomes a pseudo-organic part of the thinking, feeling, pulsating human that plays it, extending the performer's sense of time and space by widening their frame of experience. But stepping back out of the realm of fiction, the future doesn't seem to be one of expansive, long-form experiences like the ones depicted in Interstellar or Inception. Anna Lapwood started posting videos of her organ practice sessions and performances to TikTok back in 2022. Since then, she's amassed over 890,000 followers, regularly drawing in millions of views for her videos. So how is this music, of the kind where pieces often far exceed 10 minutes, intersecting with the medium of short-form content? One of the things I'm sort of most proud of, I guess, is the fact that uh, whereas five years ago people coming to my concerts were all a certain demographic that is quite predictable for classical music, now it really is such a range and a lot of those people have found me through TikTok. A lot of them have never been to a classical concert before. So most of the things I post along those lines are kind of distilling an hour of practice into one minute to 90 seconds. There is this fear in the classical music world of how do we bring together these two disparate worlds of uh, kind of differences in attention span and how do we find ways to make a Beethoven symphony feel like less of a long slog for those people for whom a half hour TV episode is a long slog. I am always mindful of that when I'm curating a program so I'm always trying to make sure I'm not putting a whole load of really really long pieces back to back. I'm also always trying to make sure that I'm speaking between pieces, not between every piece, but introducing every group of pieces and explaining why I love playing it or the things to listen out for, uh, which is sort of the same as what I'm doing on TikTok. This idea of concert curation as arranging the flow of content in terms of attention speaks to one of the main appeals of TikTok's user interface as a way of consuming entertainment. The name TikTok makes a crucial connection between the passage of time and the consumption of content in quick succession. We're encouraged to view videos as regular units of perception, just as Holub views the TikToks of the clock as producing a fundamental time formation. But rather than feeling like a barrage of individual clips that we count one by one, thanks to the user interface's reliance on the fluid vertical swiping motion, we tend to enter something akin to flow as visually we're presented with one extended experience, as opposed to an accumulative sequence of many shorter ones. Like Chopin's misleadingly titled Minute Waltz, TikToks aren't the duration of two ticks of the clock. In this way, TikTok turns us away from the measurable consistency of clock time passing second by second, and instead allows us to create an artificial state of fluid timelessness that we can manually swipe our way through. Through TikTok and other music sharing platforms, we've recently seen another time-distorting phenomenon take hold. In something of a throwback to turntables with adjustable RPMs, at the same time as things get shorter, people are also taking the time to, well, alter time. When it comes to narrative media, people are increasingly hitting fast forward, but in music, we're seeing a counter trend emerging. Slowed and reverbed versions of pre-existing songs abound, from amateur remixes to official re-releases. This phenomenon can be seen in germ form in the vaporwave movement of the 2010s, but seems to stem more recently from the popularity of the Caretaker's multi-album project Everywhere at the End of Time, where vintage songs are sampled at slower rates, eventually dissolving into ambient oblivion as the listener is taken through a simulation of the effects of dementia on the brain. Now, most amateur attempts at this aesthetic aspire to nowhere near the Caretaker's level of psychological realism, but when people mess with the timings of their favourite music, there might be a similarly physiological reason at play. 
I find it really interesting thinking about the whole sped up, slowed down TikTok sounds thing. Because I see tempo as being so heavily linked with heart rate. It's something I talk about so much with my students and I say, practice, if you're playing something under pressure, practice running up and down the stairs 10 times and see how it feels when your heart is racing. Because I think we naturally calibrate, particularly as performers, but generally, we naturally calibrate tempo against our heart rate. And so when our heart rate changes, we might feel that we're playing at the same speed, but actually we're not, we're playing it faster. And so I think when you look at those TikTok sounds where it's slowed down or sped up, I feel like part of the appeal is that we can alter our heart rate, we can alter our mood, because we know what it feels like to normally listen to that piece in relation to our heartbeat. And so if we hear it sped up, I think your heart rate naturally speeds up, or if you hear it slowed down, I think it slows down a little bit. And I'm not talking about massive amounts, but enough to make you go, oh, this is fun. Uh, and so I think there is this direct link between the tempi that we're used to, the tempo that we hear, and then our physical response to it. As with her point about the organ and its extensive superhuman breaths, Anna reminds us of the crucial fact that by merely being alive, we are literally living with music. Our heart rate is something we usually regulate unconsciously, a pulse we take for granted, but it's one of many regular rhythms that we juggle in our day-to-day -day lives. While we might always be following the clock as we go about work or leisure time, the pace at which we experience things is never as constant as the seconds we count. Viewed in this way, music becomes a sort of biohack, a way of reorienting ourselves and how we feel through the passage of time. When we listen to or make music, that present moment, the three-second unit that Miroslav Holub says we live our lives by, proves to be just the outer shell of a realm of inner experience that's far more fluid than we might initially think. Huge thanks must go to Anna Lapwood for very kindly offering her time and wisdom for this video. You can of course keep up with her amazing work on TikTok at Anna Lapwood Organ, and a link to her latest organ album, Luna, is in the description. You can also find me on TikTok at ReframedYT, as well as on Patreon where our full conversation is available for free. Keep an eye out for the next video, and in the meantime, thank you so much for watching.